Why does Jesus give his apostle a packing list when he sends them out? That's what we're going to find out today in Luke 9. So, last time we talked about God sowing the seeds and how bountiful everything will return back to us when we do. Jesus now sends out his 12 disciples. He's going to send them, and he told them that he gave them power to heal, to have power over demons just like he does, and that they should proclaim the kingdom of God. And so the message is that Jesus is the Messiah. He is here now on earth. He is healing people. His kingdom is for us. And some of the messages, the lessons that we've learned about what God wants from us isn't quite what we thought it was going to be. We find out more about what some of those messages are, but God is setting everything straight, giving a clear, definitive guideline of what his messages are and trying to get people back online. And he wants to gather everybody, 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 so that they can join in this brand new kingdom. So he tells his disciples, of course, we learn this in other gospels, that they should take nothing. Now, this says no staff, no bags, no bread, no money, and do not have two tunics. Now I'm going to have to go back and read because I thought it said that they should have those things. But whatever it is, they're supposed to basically just have the clothes on their back and go. And when people receive them, they are going to get what they need. If they don't and people reject them, they're going to shake the dust from their feet and go someplace else. Not every town, if we've seen, like the place with the pigs that got possessed, want the message of Jesus. While the woman at the well did want the message of Jesus. So there are places that do and places that don't. Part of this, people say, is the packing list is because there were traveling, I guess, preachers at the time. I heard some joke about how everybody was a rabbi back in those days because it, there was no credentialing system. So anyone could call themselves a rabbi. So people traveled town to town. And when these people did, they would carry bags and stuff and they would accumulate things as they go to the town. They would take up collections. They would grow in money and possessions because of this fake ministry they were doing. He wanted his people to be separate, to be different than those people. I am not here to make money. I'm not collecting anything. I don't want anything. The idea, too, is that these aren't going to be itinerant preachers. They are going out to the places that Jesus is sending them. They're staying there. They're going to be part of the village. They're going to know everyone. That message is going out, just like Jesus did in Capernaum, where he preached, the crowds gathered. Instead, this is going to be other places so that the message gets out. And they're going to be able to do ministry when it comes to healing and demons in the name of Jesus. This was my favorite chapter in Luke 9. In ESV, it says in the heading, Herod is perplexed. So Herod the Tetrarch, this is going to be Herod the Great's son, who I've indicated in the past chapel, I'm not impressed with. You know, Herod the Great got scholars and scribes, and they try to research things and figure out where things were at. This guy just kind of sits around and going, is that guy John the Baptist or somebody else? He is completely perplexed. He doesn't have any interest to go find out. He also is now taken his brother's wife. I mean, there's all sorts of things going on. Herod the Tetrarch's kingdom. It's not Herod the king. He was Herod the Tetrarch because Rome was like, nope, you're not that cool. We're not letting you call yourself king. Because he said, wait, was John raised from the dead? You know, Herod the Great would have gone and found out. He would have had scribes check it out. But, you know, Herod's not that cool. Quote, John has been raised from the dead. And by some that Elijah had appeared. And by others that one of the prophets has risen. And Herod's like, I beheaded John. Who is this person I keep hearing about? And it says at the end, he sought to see him. I wonder how much of an effort he put in because pretty much Jesus was seen by anyone that tried to go see Jesus. You know, even these poor people, even this poor woman who was probably banished from town. That's kind of an interesting uh, chapter. And Herod just isn't quite sure who exactly this is. And he's going to get a chance. We're going to find out when Jesus returns to Jerusalem for his final trip. He, in fact, will meet Jesus. Jesus then feeds the 5,000. We've heard that in other Gospels, too. He first suggests to the apostles who are 
complaining because the crowds are here, they're hungry, that we should send them away so they can go get something to eat. And Jesus is like, you feed them. And they're like, we don't have anything to eat. We don't have more than five loaves and two fishes. Where are we going to buy all these provisions? Someone said to feed that many people would be 500 denarii, which is 500 days wages. Can't possibly feed that many people. Jesus says, sit them down in groups, about 50. And so they did. Everyone sits down and then they take the loaves and the fish, looks up to heaven and blesses them. Does the blessing that he is going to do that we do on Passover, that we do over every meal when you're Jewish. He broke them and gave them to the disciples. It sounds so much like the first communion. And everyone handed it out. And there was plenty for everybody to eat. They had their fill. Twelve baskets were left over of food. So there was even more. God gives in abundance. He just isn't stingy about his gifts. He gives us more than we're looking for. And in this case, he fed them more than they wanted. You can't just send 5,000 people to a town. No one can feed them. Jesus, he can feed them. When you read the commentaries, they talk a lot about how the apostles get off track. They're always looking at the human thing and never looking at the God thing. They always look at the waves and never at Jesus who can rebuke the waves. And in this case, they see problems instead of looking at Jesus as the solution. It says that Jesus was praying alone and the disciples were with him. So then Jesus asks, who do the crowds say I am? I think Jesus knows what the crowds say he is, but they want the apostles to say it. And, well, you know, some people think you're John the Baptist and other people say you're Elijah. And some of them want to say that you're an old prophet who has been risen. So exactly what Herod the Tetrarch said. Isn't that weird? And so basically that's the general rumor mill. And Jesus says, who do you think I am? Who do you say I am? And of course, Jesus knows their hearts. And Peter says, the Christ, the Messiah. Christ is the Greek word for Messiah, the Messiah of God. This is a big occurrence. This first time we're literally saying, you are the Messiah. You are the Savior. Because they might have thought he was a prophet. He was a holy man. He was a wise man. He was our rabbi. All these types of things. But when you say you are the Messiah, you are the absolute one who's going to bring redemption to all of mankind and to offer this new kingdom of heaven. And being a Messiah, this is a big message in Luke throughout the entire book of Luke. And that's why this speculation of who he is and Peter coming out and saying, you are the Messiah is so important. We heard in other Gospels, what Peter says next. And right after that, Peter gets rebuked because he doesn't believe that Jesus has to die in order to bring the kingdom of heaven to people. But Jesus knows better. So that's at the point where Jesus tells his, of his death and says, don't tell people this, but I'm going to suffer many things. He's, you know, Jesus says he's going to be rejected. He's by all the power the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, if you're wanting to know what those are, I did a podcast all about them in Small Steps with God. That's what's going to happen. And then Jesus said he's going to be killed. And then on the third day raised, that is that sign of Noah, continues on that if you want to come after me, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross daily. And keep in mind, for us, cross is kind of a metaphysical idea that we take up the cross, we bear the burden of Christ. In those days, the cross was one thing. It was how Romans put people to death. The cross led to death. And then he continues on. Whoever tries to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses it for my sake will save it. Because what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose himself? If you're ashamed of me and my word, you know, Jesus is telling him, then the son of man, me, I'm going to be ashamed. When I come in my glory, he says, and be with the Father and the holy angels, that there will be some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. That is when Jesus is going to return and that redemption plan solved and they're going to see it. And he's telling them that. This is Luke right here giving the full message of the gospel. This is what's going to happen. This is what you're going to see. And this is the fulfillment of God's rescue plan for mankind. Everybody, 
whether you're Jewish, you're part of the Christian faith, you're non-Christian, you need to follow Jesus. And that means that you're going to have to deny yourself. You're going to sacrifice maybe up to your own life for the cross. And he is going to fulfill the whole ministry by being put to death, gone for three days, and then coming back. Right there. That's, that's it right there. The whole message of the gospel. We have the transfiguration. Luke's is a little bit different in this particular case. We'll talk about it. But they, it says that after eight days of this, Peter, John, and James went up to the mountain, and he was praying. And suddenly, it says that his face was altered, and his clothes became white. And two men were talking with him. There's Moses, and there's Elijah. So we find out here that John the Baptist is not Elijah coming back, because everyone would have gone, hey, there's John. No one did that. So Peter and those that were there were sleeping heavily. They were deep out cold. I mean, you must be in order to have this transfiguration, this bright light happen. And it says in other gospels, they fell dead asleep because of what they saw. And here's some interesting wording in there. It said it spoke of his departure and what he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Now, I made up the last time. It was a good joke. But what were they talking about? You know, oh, people, they're the worst, right? No, he wasn't talking about that. They were talking about what Jesus was about to do. All this time, all this fulfillment is coming to an end right here very soon. Moses, being the man who led his people away from captivity of slavery, he would understand how difficult that is. Jesus is about to take that big journey and, in this case, deliver people from the captivity of sin not the captivity of slavery. He was constantly talking about the hope of God, even though at the very end he got hopeless. But that was his whole part of it, is that he understood that all hope was in God and that he was there to announce the coming of the Messiah. That was the the role they wanted. Jesus is going to be like a Moses figure, but better. Instead of captivity, it's going to be releasing us from the power of sin. So when the apostles, it said, were deep in sleep, I think in the other Gospels, it mentioned them passing out or fainting to death. They saw the men that were with him. And again, Peter's like, we could build tents and take you with us. You know, I think that was the idea is put this show on the road and show everybody. I think when you believe in Jesus or you believe, you know, in someone who comes and talks to you, you want to show everyone how wonderful it is. I think they wanted to take this and show everybody how amazing this was. Then it says, the cloud covered all of them. And the voice said, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And then Jesus was alone. It says that he told them not to say about anything what they saw. Again, as the word gets out, all of this, and I'm sure Peter wanted to tell everybody because that's the kind of guy he is. In this case, it says that Luke's word uh, is not metamorphize, is the common Greek term. Because we, if you know anything about Greek mythology, see in Greek mythology, gods turning into things. You'll see Athena become an owl and you see Zeus become something and then, you know, do something amongst people. This is not a Greek idea of a god changing into form like they're used to seeing. This is a transfiguration. This is something more special. This is bright. This is the glory of God. and so. Luke makes it quite clear this is not what you think it is. Jesus is not just one of your gods turning into something. I think the other interesting thing about this being Moses and Elijah, too, is that when we think of the Old Testament, we have some parts of it, right? We have all the history that leads up to Moses leading the people out and to become the land of Israel. Then we have the post-Exodus world where Israel builds as a nation, and we start to look at the promises of God, the new covenants, and with the prophets, because keep in mind that the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees, only believed in the first five books of the Bible, but Elijah representing the world of the prophets, where we're telling what's going to happen, the fulfillment of the land of Israel, the fulfillment of the Messiah coming and saving everybody. That's from the prophets. So each of these represents one, the first five books of the Bible called the Torah, and now the prophets, which 
is part of what Elijah was a part of, too. These are both aspects of the Old Testament coming right before our brand new apostles. And it's interesting to keep in mind that when the word that Moses uses in Greek is the exact word for Exodus. So we are saying this is our brand new Exodus. Jesus is about to deliver people to the new promised land, which is not like the old promised land. This is going to be the kingdom of God promised land. Jesus heals then the boy who had the unclean spirit, the spirit, and maybe the boy also had epilepsy, but the spirit throws the boy down. And again, the apostles are perplexed. Like, why couldn't we do this? We tried to do this and it didn't work and Jesus could do it. And that's where Jesus laments, oh, faithless and twisted generation. How long am I going to be with you and bear with you and bring the son here? And he heals the boy. The demon throws him to the ground and the demon leaves. I don't know at this point is a little bit perplexing about whether or not a lack of faith that the apostles who were there didn't believe that a demon this strong or this whatever it was doing to this poor boy was something they could go and remove. So they weren't able to release the demon because they didn't have faith or something like that. We don't know. But at this point, you can hear the lament in Jesus' voice as he does heal the boy and calls them faithless. And he says, let these words sink into your ears. If you have ears here, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. They didn't understand it. You know, no one knows what to say, right? So then we get the argument among all of them, who is the greatest? And again, Jesus knows their hearts. And he takes the child who is with the crowd and says, you know, whoever is like this child and receives me, you're receiving the one who sent me. That's God the Father. He is among you. Oh, this boy, this, this little child is the least of us, but yet he's great. Children? Much like women, we're not considered to be that great. Yet, this lowly child was the greatest, not y'all. Then they saw the guy who was not a part of them casting out demons in the name of Jesus. They said, we tried to stop that guy because he's not a part of us. He says, quote, do not stop him for those who is not against you is for you. I think we live in that age where anyone who's not exactly like us doesn't say the things we want them to say, they're not us. And so we draw that line pretty sharply these days. I don't think Jesus drew that line in the way we do, and that's something to consider. Then the Samaritan town rejects Jesus. So they are drawing near. They're starting to mosey on over towards Jerusalem. So this is the Exodus part, right? We are now leading our people through. And he sent messengers ahead of them, and they were supposed to go to the villages of the Samaritan. And it says, prepare the way. But they're going to tell people. They're going to say the Messiah is coming. He's about to be here. And when James and John saw it, that they were rejected. And this is where um, they, James and John say, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down on them, consume them? Oh, goodness. And he rebuked him. Of course, Jesus did. Jesus does not want to send fire down on them. Jesus just wants to go and tell somebody else. He does not want to send fire down to consume people. This is a unique story in Luke, it says, and you can see this message going out to Samaria. We know that he talked to Samaritans, but th in this case, he sends people out to go and talk to the Samaritans specifically. Let them know. We know the town with the woman at the well, accepted Jesus. But there is so much mistrust between the people of Israel, the Jews, and the Samaritans. It's a hard relationship to get over. And in this case, some of those towns couldn't get over it. Then Jesus talks at the end about the cost, it says in the ESV, about following Jesus. You know, there's going to be a cost. This is where we hear the whole full parts of the story in the other Gospels where a man came and wanted to follow Jesus. And Jesus, and I believe this was a teacher of law or scribe, and Jesus says, you know, I don't have a, a place to lay my head. You know, it talks about all, even the animals and the birds, they have their homes, and I don't. And if you're going to follow me, you won't either. 
He said the one thing, again, that guy didn't want to hear. The man left in the other Gospels, it says. To another, he, see, Jesus tells the man to follow him. And he says, oh, I have to go bury my father. We hear this parable in other places. Jesus is harsh with him. You know, leave the dead to bury their own. Instead, go proclaim the gospel of Jesus. We know that man didn't. He left dejected. We don't even know if that man's father was dead. Maybe he was saying, my dad's old. He's going to die soon. As soon as he's dead, I'll come follow you. Father Mike Schmitz, in talking about this passage, said that telling God not now is the same as telling God no. <laughs> so keep that in mind. And then another man says, I want to follow you, but first let me say goodbye to those people at my home. And he, Jesus says to him, quote, no one who put his hand on the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Plowing? You're supposed to plow in straight lines. Have you ever seen anyone plow? straight lines, right? It's very difficult, but you don't look backwards because if you look backwards, you're going to make it crooked. You might hurt an animal. You don't do that. This is about kingdom forward, moving forward. And so these three men all had problems that their expectations of following Jesus were far different than what it actually is to follow Jesus. And he knew the people to say, follow me and those who were going to just immediately follow him. Kudos to the apostles for that, by the way. But he also knew these people's hearts and knew what they weren't willing to do. That um, turning back or looking back reminds me of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And they were told not to look back. Don't look back when we're talking about the kingdom of God and the promises he has. There will always be in front of us, not in back of us. And Jesus will always be the priority over our own comfort over our own families, and over whatever it is that's in our rear windshield. Jesus is always going to be in the front windshield, and it's always going to be about the future and the promise. Woo! So that ends Luke 9. What I'm going to meditate on this week is the fact that God says that whoever is not against us is for us, that we should not be so narrow-minded in who we think is us. That's for God to decide who is in and out. We, I think, limit our vision. This is a person not in my church, not in my denomination, not in my school of thought. I'm going to have to think a lot more about who is actually for us instead of stopping people who don't fit exactly the checkboxes we think someone should fit. What I'm going to pray about is that faith of abundance, that God doesn't just come through for us at the end. He comes through for people in abundance. He is able to set everything right. And when he feeds people, he feeds over the amount of people. When he made the wine in Cana for the wedding, there was an abundance of wine and it was good wine. He is not sparse in his miracles. And what I'm going to share with others is how we should never take our eyes and look behind us. We should worry less about where we're going to put our head, about what's going to happen with our families, and instead focus on the front view, the kingdom of God, what is to come. That is where our eyes should always be. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember, A Better Life in Small Steps is our blog. My friend Em and I run the blog, and we write articles, but they are meant to be slower. We're not going to push out an article every day at you. It's also the hub of all the podcasts. So if you're ever interested in what other podcasts I have, I have Start With Small Steps, Small Steps With God, and Buzz Blossom and Squeak among this podcast. But you can find the links to all of them at abetterlifeinsmallsteps.com. Thanks so much for listening. <music>